Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you, according to the wisdom given to him, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. There are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and un unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Words from the second epistle of Peter, chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. As you hear those words, I don't know if you are as encouraged as I am to hear that even the writers of the New Testament found some of what Paul had to say hard to understand with the capacity of being twisted to destruction by those who are ignorant and unstable. Those are strong words indeed. And the way in which we might see Paul's words to be twisted will depend very much on our own contexts, our own suppositions as we come to read these. So in this introductory lecture, I want to jump in and explore with you some of the complex words that Paul uses to talk about some of the issues which have become most contentious in not only his writings, but in fact, the whole Bible. I'm not sure that when he wrote them, they were anywhere near as controversial as they are today, by the way, but we'll explore that as we go. So this introductory lecture is intended to introduce you to some of the words and ideas that Paul uses when he talks about women and men together, and when he mentions what we would nowadays call same-sex relationships, although Paul wouldn't recognise any of those words to, re to refer to any of his experience in his own context. So let's jump in. Before we jump into Paul's world, let's pause and think about our own. It goes without saying that the way in which we read and interpret the Bible, the sense we make of it, will depend very much on our own cultural context. We have inherited 2000 years of Christian faith and our own particular individual experience of Christianity will have been filtered through various churches, various preachers, various books we've read, hymns we've sung, pictures we've seen, friends we have made, stories we've heard. We bring our whole selves, our whole history, our whole context into our understanding of the Bible. It's not a bad thing. In fact, it's inevitable. There's no other way to come other than as the hymn puts it, just as we are. But it is important to, to acknowledge and to try the best that we can to give an account for our own positionality as readers, our own context. This is particularly true when it comes to gender roles because um, our lives are so defined by what we understand as being what is right and good and proper in relation to our status and our uh, right role as the gender that we are. Now, when I haven't even mentioned any of the biblical texts yet, but I'm sure that some of you are already thinking of, of what they're going to be. And many of us would have heard biblical texts used in ways that have been really damaging, in ways that have really turned people off God, turned people off church, which have done great, great harm to people, maybe particularly women and LGBT plus people. Um, if you don't particularly recognise this as part of your experience, that's that's fine, obviously, that's good, isn't it? But if you think, goodness, the Bible has been used terribly of um, women, then um, you're not alone there. And um, the same also goes for LGBT plus people. In the um, medieval book of Marjorie Kemp, which was written um, in the in, in, in the mid 15th century. Um, Marjorie is a woman from Kings Lynn in Norfolk, and she is friends with Julian of Norwich. She goes to see Julian at one point. She's a mystic. She's a visionary. 
And all the way through her book, she has mystical encounters not only with God, but with saints. And at one point, Paul comes to her in a vision and apologises to her and says, my sister, I see that you have suffered much tribulation as a result of what I have written. I will pray to God that you would receive blessings even greater than the tribulations that you have received because of me. It's an extraordinary moment in a undoubtedly quite complex and daring medieval mystical text. Um, it's interesting to try and speculate what exactly is Paul apologising for here. After all, Marjorie Kemp is not a preacher and therefore she doesn't break what might well have been taken as one of the golden rules in the Pauline corpus when it comes to the role of women. The, role, the impact of Paul on women, though, has been um, enormous in um, many, if not most, generations. Some of us might well have heard biblical texts used not only to, to hurt people, but to legitimate the maintaining of unhealthy power dynamics between men and women to keep the status quo as it is, even if that status quo is abusive. We need to give an account for this as Christians um, and we need to be honest about it. Some of us have wrestled with these texts and some of us have wrestled with them long and hard and arrived at what might be grouped broadly conservative theological or social positions. So in this lecture, I'm not going to try and convince you that I am right and that there is a particular way that therefore we must live as a result of what we read in these texts, but to, but to open up some of the complexities of them so that you can see the ways in which people have reached the conclusions that they have, whilst also being re realistic and honest about the harm that these texts can do and being able to reckon with that in our own minds, in our own hearts. Within the group that we have in ERMC, there are probably lots of different theological positions and indeed probably lots of different stories that could be told. So as you listen to this lecture and as you prepare to come into class to discuss the ideas, do please be aware and sensitive to the impact of your words on others whose experiences might be very different to your own. I'm sure you would do that anyway. So what approach am I going to take in this lecture? The approach that I'm going to take is very socio-historic, trying to get back to the world in which Paul lived and wrote, and very literary rhetorical, because what we have are the letters. We can't uh, get Paul on Zoom. We can't um, access him any other way than by what he wrote, the letters that have now <coughs> sorry, found their way into the canon of scripture. So we're going to look in detail at the words that Paul wrote with a great emphasis on the original Greek, not least because some of the words that he uses to talk about men and women are complex and it would be very helpful for us to know a bit more about them. Now, this isn't the only way of reading the Bible. There are lots of other approaches that are completely valid. For example, the reader response approach in which we come as readers to the text without that first century knowledge, without that understanding of the Greek words, but with our own lives, our own contexts, our own experiences, and to be open to what the text is saying to us. Reader response um, Bible study can be used to powerful effect and I would not want to knock it for one moment but that's not the approach that I'm going to use with us now. I'm taking the socio-historic and literary rhetorical approach because I think it's very healthy and very good for us all to step out of our context every now and then to try the best that we can to immerse ourselves in another world especially if we're trying to understand someone else. We might have a friend who lives in a different country to us, who speaks a different language to us as their first language. We can get to know that person really well and we can uh, share all sorts of experiences with them. But if we really want to understand them, then it's good to go and visit them at home 
to see them in their own home country, to be with them as they speak their own language, and even to try and join in a little bit to eat their food as well. And that's what we're going to try and do with Paul today, to go to his house, so to speak, so that we can understand a little bit better uh, who he is and why he's saying what he does. And of course, when we make those kinds of trips, when we make those kind of journeys, we come back to our own world with new eyes, with a bigger perspective, with broadened horizons, with the possibility of seeing things that we might not have seen before or seeing things differently that we have seen a thousand times already. So let's try then to understand something of Paul's world. Paul lived in three overlapping worlds. They were the Roman, the Greek and the Hebrew world. Paul was a Roman citizen. He says this at various points, uh, particularly in the book of Acts. We'll come and look at each one of these in detail. So Paul was a Roman citizen in the Roman Empire, obviously. Paul was somebody who wrote in Greek, really very good Greek at certain times. When we focus on Romans, we might notice, for example, that the introduction to the letter to the Romans, let me just quickly find it, um, Romans 1, uh, verses 1 to um, 7, seven verses in Greek. It's all one sentence. It's formal rhetorical writing here. So Paul is someone who is writing in Greek, sometimes um, in a way that's very down to earth, and unpolished, but at other times in writing that is very carefully constructed and very beautifully written. And of course, he is a Jewish man. He comes from the Hebrew people. And we'll think about each one of these three worlds. And of course, to add another layer to this, he becomes a part of the Jesus movement. He becomes part of the community of early Christianity. And so he's, he, he lives in these overlapping worlds and we'll think about each one of them one by one now. Let's think of them particularly in relation to what they have to say about women. First of all, let's think about the Greek world. As you probably know, the Greek world kind of, um, uh, well, the ancient world was swept by Alexander the Great in the fourth century BCE, uh, who rose up um, and conquered at great speed the known worlds. And um, Greek um, poetry and Greek philosophy had reached something of a high point already at this time. What did the Greeks have to say about women? Well, two of the most famous and the most impactful writers were Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle, um, yeah, and Plato, both obviously Greek philosophers. When you hear what they have to say for the first time, it can be really shocking, but be prepared to be shocked. None of this would have been shocking to Paul. Plato writes, it is only males who were created directly by the gods and are given souls. Those who live rightly return to the stars, but those who were cowards or lead unrighteous lives may with reason be supposed to have changed into the nature of women in the second generation. This downward progress may continue through successive reincarnations unless reversed. In this situation, Obviously, it is only men who are complete human beings and can hope for ultimate fulfilment. The best a woman can hope for is to become a man. So that's Plato. He also does say, by the way, that women should be educated in the Greek city state, the Greek polis. So women uh, might be defective males, uh, to use the Aristotelian language, but they still are able to learn. Let's then go to Aristotle, that great thinker who influenced the thought world of the West in a way that has um, never ceased to be important. 
he writes about the difference between men and women and the differences that he draws are these that the male is active and the female is passive the male is rational the female is emotional the male is normal and the female is a departure from the norm he writes the role of the soul over the body is natural which makes the male by nature superior and the female inferior <clears throat> the one who rules and the other is rules the courage of the man is shown in commanding of a woman in obeying if then the male stands for the effective and active and the woman for the passive it follows that the female would create sorry contribute contribute to the semen that, sorry what the female would contribute to the semen of the male would not be semen but would rather be matter material for the semen to work upon this is another warning by the way in this lecture we are going to get a little bit um specific about um anatomy and about reproduction because this is important for us to understand in trying to make sense of what Paul receives in his own thought world and that last quote there the female is as it were a defective male okay so as I say when you hear these things for the first time they can sound horrific they can sound really shocking it's important to recognize that actually Paul does not say this Paul says something really quite different when it comes to men and women. Let's hold those thoughts in our minds, though. You'll notice, by the way, that, of course, because Plato and Aristotle are both pre-Christians, because they are Greeks, they believe in the pantheon of the gods. So um, Plato writes about being created directly by the gods, OK, returning to the stars and that, 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 that sense of um, uh, reincarnation essentially not in the kind of eastern hindu way but in the way that the same um, lives get lived again and again aristotle was somebody whose impact on the world um, comes down to in part at least his incredible ability to categorize things now in order to categorize things you need to know what they are and then you can put them in order and Aristotle does this with absolutely everything with every creature that lives every star in the sky and he does it in the political sphere too and so he writes something that's named a household code okay if a household is to be well run well ordered then it needs to be run and ordered in a way that chimes in with the, what Aristotle would see as the natural order of the cosmos. And this is what this looks like on a day to day basis in a um, in a household in the Greek city state in the Greek polis. He says of household management, we have seen that there are three parts. One is the rule of a master over slaves, another of a father and the third of a husband. A husband and father we saw rules over wife and children both free but the rule differs the rule over his children being a royal over his wife a constitutional rule okay don't know what any of you think about the idea of a husband ruling over his wife with a constitutional rule but for, for aristotle this was what a healthy happy family looked like you just might want to take a moment to note that in the New Testament we have um, several examples of household codes. We have them, for example, in Colossians, in Ephesians and in First John, and they are Christianized versions of um, a, a literary practice that was very, very uh, normal in uh, Greco-Roman culture. And again, we might think of some of the quite controversial, now controversial passages in those household codes for example uh, that's in Ephesians in which let me just quickly find it um, Ephesians 5 flicking through my Bible uh, going to the wrong 
order. So, Ephesians 5, 21 to 33, the household code. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It also says, wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband, for the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the saviour. OK, so we'll come back to what's going on in this head language in a few moments time. But the thing to note here is that love is the centre of the early Christian household codes, not rule. Now, as I say, Aristotle was somebody who had boundless um, curiosity about not only the natural world, but also the world beyond his own vision. Aristotle's cosmology might sound rather arcane and you might wonder how on earth we've managed to wander off from talking about men and women to looking up and looking at the stars and, and, and wondering about the movements of the universe. But for Aristotle, all of these things were interlinked. Some scholars say that analogical thinking is inherent to the ancient Greek worldview. In other words, everything has an an analogy with everything else. Everything is harmonious when things are right. It's when things are out of harmony that um, society breaks down and uh, lives are suffering. So Aristotle believed that the cosmos, that word simply means, uh, actually John in, in his gospel uses the word cosmos um, to talk about the, the love of God. Uh, that word is, is, is normally translated into English as world, but it's it's a very expansive word. It's, it's as big as our imaginations. What we would call space in this particular instance here. Aristotle believed that the cosmos consists of concentric circles. If you can think of a kind of perfectly spherical Russian doll, each one fitting perfectly into the others. And the earth is at the very, very centre of this. And we see little glimpses of this sometimes in the uh, New Testament. For example, when Paul talks about his vision in at the very end of the second letter to the Corinthians, he talks about um, being uh, caught up to the third heaven, that's um, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 2. It's the kind of thing that is easy to miss, but it's not arbitrary. It's not, um, uh, you know, meaningless. It would have great meaning to him because he would live in a world in which, in a thought world, in which there is a sense that, 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 that there are layers to, have, to the heavens. And accordingly, at each of these layers, there are also different heavenly beings. So it's not just one word for angels. There are lots and lots and lots of different words for angels and for heavenly beings who would tra travel up and down between these different levels of the heavens and then come down to earth um, from time to time too, which is why, for example, in Hebrews, uh, at the very end of Hebrews, you get that little mysterious encouragement not to neglect hospitality because many have done so and have entertained angels unawares. That's Hebrews 13, verse 12, verse 2, sorry. But the kind of, and again, that's not just a nice little rhetorical flourish. That's to say angels move between these different layers of, of the heavenlies and they might pop down to earth every now and then. OK, that's very, very, very Aristotelian. And as you've just picked up from what I've said, that would be the the map of the universe that would be in Paul's imagination. OK, so the heavenly bodies are perfect. They all move in perfect uh, circles because it's in their nature to do so. OK, rather than in uh, response to any particular force. So this isn't necessarily a mechanical universe as we get in the kind of post enlightenment Western mindset, whereby there is a force that acts on another and therefore a sequence of events is set off. But rather in this Aristotelian cosmology, there is the understanding that it's intrinsic to the nature of each thing to act and to move in the ways in, in, in which uh, sorry, which promote harmony in the whole of the cosmos. 
and the earth, as I say, is at the centre of this. And in the earth, you have city states, you have the Greek poloi, the, the polis is the city state. And in the polis, you have the oikos, which is the Greek household. And in the oikos, you have the family, you have the husband, you have the wife, you have the children. And if you can imagine another um, version of this picture, which I've put here on this slide, which has even more detail in it. And maybe you might need to use a magnifying glass to see it, but you would see in this more magnified version, a Greek polis as, as, as another little con concentric circle. And then you'd see that oikos, the household in that. And then you would see the husband and the wife and the children. OK, that helps us to get a sense of why Paul talks in terms of these kind of layers of authority that we see in social relationships between men and women. So, as I say, this is really important in understanding uh, social roles of men and women, because they too are part of the cosmos. They too have within them the nature to act and to move in a certain way as to promote harmony in the cosmos. OK, Greek medicine is another area of huge impact. The Corpus Hippocratum is a collection of writings that was kind of gradually compiled between the 5th and the 2nd centuries BCE, written obviously not by one person, but by a whole load of people. And obviously this was long before all of the medical advances that we have in our world today. But there was a very great deal of um, medical advancement that took place in the Hellenistic era, in the Greek era. Um, it's really worth looking this up, especially if you come from a medical background, it's really interesting. The emergent um, understanding of what makes the body work in the ancient Greek worlds is this. The human body is a balance of four fluids. OK, you have blood, you have black bile, you have yellow bile and you have phlegm. It's delightful, isn't it? So blood is hot and dry. This will come on to be very important in a minute. Black bile is hot and wet. Yellow bile is cold and dry and phlegm is cold and wet. Now, here's the thing. Remember that Aristotle said that the male uh, is the normal uh, human physique, OK, and that the woman is the defective male. Now, the reason for this is not simply because Aristotle was sexist, although, of course, lots of people do think he is just plain old sexist. But the reason for this was that um, Aristotle and then those who worked in the medical spheres uh, went on to say that, that men's bodies are just the right temperature. OK, and men's bodies are just the right amount of moisture. That's what makes them normative. OK, so men are warm and dry. That's nice, isn't it? And women for, um, yes, Aristotle and the writers of the Corpus Hippocratum and Galen, who will come on to in a moment, um, believe that actually the thing with women's bodies is that they're too cold. And actually, as a woman who feels the cold, this always makes me laugh. And women are too moist. We have too many bodily fluids, OK? And so this is what differentiates male and female bodies. One uh, really interesting and impactful medic of the early Christian period, Galen, writes about what's the difference between male and female bodies. And again, the first time you hear this, it might be really shocking. It might be quite disturbing, actually, which is partly why I wanted to record in, uh, a lecture to give you time to kind of think, goodness, did they really believe that um, before we actually gather for our class? So this was the belief that male and female genitals are basically the same. OK. Uh, more or less identical. In fact, this is the one sex theory which Galen uh, saw as, as self-evidently true. OK, however, because women are colder than men, the genitals remain inside the body to stay warm. 
okay? Uh, whereas men's bodies, because they're just the right temperature, uh, the genitals can be um, external, okay? And um, there's lots of interesting uh, writing in, in Galen's text. Remember this analogical thing, there's always an, an analogy that helps us make sense of what we see. So there are lots of analogies that are made between female and male reproductive organs, okay? The idea was that um, simply that the women's um, reproductive organs were smaller than the men's and were inside the body. The male's um, reproductive organs are outside of the body and are larger, okay? That's what Galen would say, that's the difference between a male and a female body. And um, one of the big controversial kind of uh, debates in ancient Greek med medicine was whether women actually do anything physically to contribute to the um, development of a fetus in utero or whether the woman's body is entirely passive, whether it's the seed, into, sorry, the, the field into which the male seed is, is sown. And Galen would be seen as quite progressive actually on this question because he said yes. A woman's body does have a seed in it, but but because the woman's body is 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 cold, that seed is is kind of inert, and it only can really uh, come to life when it's uh, enlivened by the warmer male seed. So you need a a man and a woman to make a baby. Um, the really important book that's been written in in much more recent times is Thomas Lecoeur's Making Sex, Body and Gender from, from the Greeks to Freud. He wrote that in 1992. And his argument is that this one sex model predominates in ancient thought and in, in, in fact kind of lasts much, 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 much longer than we might expect it to. So there's a medieval uh, saying, which is that the coldest uh, man is warmer than the warmest woman. Okay, and it's that same idea that women are inherently cold, men are inherently warm. Okay, yeah. So, um, some scholars have argued that Thomas Lecure um, over eggs the pudding, that he makes um, makes it too much of a, 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 a definitive argument. Uh, whereas there are those um, who write about male and female differentiation um, in the ancient world and then through to the medieval period and who um, can, can, can basically give an account for much greater differentiation between ma male and female bodies. Um, as far as I'm aware though, I don't think that anybody has said that this one sex model was not very, very influential because it really was, okay? Now again, we're entering into Paul's world here and we can see how different it is from our own. In our world, it's self-evident that male and female are, are different and that male and female reproductive organs are different. Sometimes we talk about the opposite sex, although that's very contentious in today's world in which we are grappling to find a language uh, that will describe the experiences of those who don't fit neatly into the male and female uh, dichotomy, uh, even words like transgender, non-binary, uh, are working with a, a, a two-sex model of understanding of, of biology, because that's what our post-Enlightenment Western inheritance gives us. It's just worth noting all of that, okay? It's not to say that, you know, Galen was right and we're wrong. It's not to say that in another 2,000 years, people might have a completely different view of gender and biological sex all over again. But it's worth just seeing how different this way of looking at bodies is and say, actually, in the first century, nobody thought Galen was mad. OK, people might have thought that he might have accentuated one aspect a bit too much, but nobody would think that he was fundamentally wrong and nobody would think that he was fundamentally um, unjust in what he said. So there's a great deal in there to consider, isn't there? So as I mentioned earlier, of course, Paul is a Roman citizen. So the Roman period kind of began around 31 BCE and then lasted long after the time when the New Testament canon was complete. Um, this didn't mean that the axe fell on Greek culture, not at all. Um, I love this quote by Horace, who is a Roman poet, 
captive Greece held captive her uncouth conqueror and brought the arts to the rustic Latin lands. Isn't that beautiful? Um, when the Romans uh, rose up as a conquering power, um, they wanted to hold on to the glories and the uh, achievements of Greek culture. Why would they not? OK, so um, by the time the New Testament is being written, we're living well and truly in the Roman period. But there's no way that the New Testament is going to be written in anything other than Greek. Greek is still the language of literature. It's still the language of achievements. Um, OK. So, the Roman family, this is what I want us to think about. I don't know if you saw books like this when you were at school, but there's a happy Roman family at home with the mother in the middle there, children playing. There is the father, I think it says he's paying a merchant over in the corner there. So the Roman family is of great importance. Of course, the Roman emperor, um, had his own family and the Roman imperial family uh, set the tone for the whole empire, even though most people did never got to meet them. If you think back to this, um, if, if you think back to the slide that we just saw and the enormous spread of the Roman Empire, it was huge. So it's not that people were invited round to the Roman imperial family's house for um, banquets. No. That would be impossible. But um, but 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 the very um, high ranking um, Romans and particularly the imperial family were those who embodied what a family is to be. And what is that? Well, when again, the first time we see um, the details about the Roman family, it can be really shocking, actually. Um, because when we hear the word family, again, depending on our own context, and this is where we do need to do some thinking and reflecting on our own understanding of words like family and the associations that those words have in our own experiences. Um, we see here that the Roman family is really different. OK, we look at the role of the pater familias, the, the head of the household, the farm, father of the family, and um, there is no way that in any of our countries in uh, modern Europe, uh, you could have somebody taking a, such a role in a family today. The pater familias was legally responsible for every member of the family, including his wife. He owned all the property. He made all the decisions about the family. He acted as the family priest and judge. Again, bear in mind that this is a, um, polytheistic world in which each household has its own household gods okay each village will have its own local gods and for each occasion there will be a god who can be invoked to bless and to assure success and within that world of, of many 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 gods uh the, the the part of familias would be the one to call upon the household gods and invoke them the pater familias had almost infinite power over his children. He could deny that a child was his simply by refusing to acknowledge it. And again, that's shocking if we think about that in relation to our own world of, of, of uh, um, paternity tests and um, of obligations towards those whom we have um, biologically brought into the world even if we don't go on to live with them and be an ongoing part of their lives. This idea that simply by saying that a child is not one's own, one can legally um, disown them is, is utterly shocking. This was a brutal world in so many ways. Yes, the part of familias could decide to punish, adopt, sell or kill a member of the family. Like I say, almost infinite power. And this power remains with the part of familias until his death, when it gets passed on to the oldest son. So that's not to say that families were not happy, but the power dynamics within families were much, much stronger than we would mostly accept as normal today. Okay, Paul was a Jew. 
he was part of the Hebrew people. So let's just think for a moment about what this means. The Hebrew people are a people with a story. One of the most ancient uh, creeds in the Bible is thought to be this from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 26, verse 5. Then you shall declare before Yahweh your God, my father was a wandering Aramean and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. It's interesting to see that this is not a creed in the sense that we have with, for example, the Nicene Creed, a set of propositional statements that make logical, rational sense, but rather a story. Uh, to say this is this defines my identity. My father was a wandering Aramean and to claim your own identity as part of that story. And within this story, there are lots of women. OK, I've just uh, mentioned here a couple of types of women. There were matriarchs. We might think of people like Sarah and Rebecca. There were judges, Deborah. There were wise women, such as the woman of Tekoa, whom David consults when his back's against the wall. Women play a key role in bringing about God's intergenerational plan of salvation. We might think of people like Esther. There were prostitutes who became part of the story. Goma, the wife of Hosea, Rahab, who plays a key role and is mentioned in Hebrews 11 for it. Temptresses. Or are they people like Bathsheba? Is she a temptress or is she abused? Incomers like Ruth. There is a sense in which women's uncleanness is always in the minds of Bible writers. Ezekiel 36, 17 uses uh, this metaphor. Their conduct in my sight was like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual period. So if you want a metaphor for uncleanness, there it is, women's bodies. That says a lot, doesn't it? This was an undoubtedly patriarchal society. And so even though we see these women and we give thanks for them, we need to recognise that their power was limited because they lived in a world that was dominated by men. How does this play on then after the end of the Old Testament and into the intertestamental period? There are three really different portrayals of women that I just want to mention. And um, we can see the um, implications of this in the New Testament. The first, again, this can be shocking when we hear it. Some words from Ben Sirah, which is one of the intertestamental books that we get in the Apocrypha. Better is the wickedness of a man than a woman who does good. It is a woman who brings shame and disgrace. So a wicked man is better than a good woman. Hmm. Fourth Maccabees has the story of the seven sons who martyr themselves for the sake of the Jewish people. And their mother is held up as a great exemplar. O mother of the nation, vindicator of the law and champion of religion, who carried away the prize of the contest in your heart, O more noble than males in steadfastness, and more courageous than men in endurance. OK, so because she allows her seven sons to go to their death, she is uh, eulogised in this language better than men. What higher compliment could there be in the ancient world? And then women as metaphors. We've seen that already in Ezekiel, but here it is again in Second Esdras. The woman whom you see is Zion, which you now behold as a city being built. So women as kind of metaphorical beings. And we see that too in Galatians. Uh, we might think of the way in which um, Paul writes about Sarah and Hagar in Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to um, 5, verse 1. Sarah is a metaphor for freedom and Hagar is a metaphor for slavery. He doesn't do the same kind of thing with two men, it's worth noting. Although, of course, as we've seen, Paul does contrast Adam and Jesus. 
OK, just a few words about women in the Jesus movement. But when the time, sorry, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son born of a woman. OK, the um, virgin birth is um, powerfully important in Christian theology. But one of the things it does, particularly in the early church, is to um, validate the reality of Christ's humanity by saying that Jesus came into the world by being born naturally. OK, the role of women in bringing Jesus into the world is intrinsic to the Christian gospel. And then you get women in the early church. This moment here in Luke Act, when a whole lot of women are named as those who went uh, with the disciples and were part of Jesus circle. We've mentioned already Jesus as the last Adam. And when we think about Romans 5, which is the chapter in which Paul talks about Jesus as the last Adam, we note that the language that is used is degendered or gender free. There is nothing of gender in Romans 5 verses 11 to 21. But of course, when we think of Genesis chapter one, and we think of the creation of Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, we see those words. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So to be human, to be gendered, is intrinsic to being a, a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve, as, as C.S. Lewis puts it. So let's think then about what's going on. Okay, baptism is how we become part of the new creation. That's what we see in Romans 6. Our old self is put to death so that our new self can be raised to walk in newness of life. And then that takes us to Galatians chapter 3, 23 to 29. I would really encourage you to read that passage. You might want to just pause this recording at this point and go and just read Galatians 3, 23 to 29. We're going to have a closer look at it just in a moment's time. OK, so a closer look at Galatians 3. I'm going to pick up on some keywords here. Now, before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Powerful, beautiful words. Let's look a bit more closely at some of them. First of all, the verb pair that is used in verse 23 imprisoned and guarded. Now those words are rather harsh to say the least, aren't they? Um, not many of us like the idea of being either imprisoned or guarded. Okay, I've given you the Greek words there, but the thing to say is that both of these words have quite a broad semantic range. In other words, they can be translated in a, in a, in a number of different ways. The word imprisoned could be translated protected. And if you think about it, when prisons are good, they are for the protection not only of the society outside the prison gates, but to protect those inside too. OK, and uh, the second verb guarded or kept together. OK, sounds quite different, doesn't it? To say that the purpose of the law is either to imprison and guard or to protect and keep us together. Now, when you say it like that, you'll see what a tricky business translation is. 
is it that the law is seen as something which is is basically good in which case we might go for the more attractive words protected and kept together or do we see the law as something bad in which case we might go for imprisoned and guarded there is certainly a strong contrast here between law and faith what is the purpose of the law well a big clue is given in the um, metaphor that comes ever so slightly later the word disciplinarian now that's another really complicated word and again in english it can sound really harsh um do i need a disciplinarian do you need a disciplinarian one would hope not okay the greek word is much more interesting than the english word it's pedagogos okay and if you um know anything at all about teaching you'll have a little bell ringing in your mind now the word pedagogy is to do with teaching okay a pedagogos in greek uh, and roman society was um a person quite often a, a slave but a high-ranking slave who lived with the roman family and who looked after the children so that the child would be brought up as a good citizen in the greek polis in 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 the roman polis in the city city state okay um the pedagogos was to protect the children too boys in particular for reasons we'll come on to see in a moment were um looked upon by older men as very attractive sexual prey okay and so um by the way the word paedophile is used in greek literature and it's used um in ways that are much more accepting than could ever 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 be the case nowadays part of what the pedagogos does is to protect the sons of the uh greco-roman family from paedophiles from those who would rape them when they're out in the streets okay there are mentions in greek literature of men offering boys tuition academic tuition athletic tuition money food luring them off the path so that they can um, have sex with them and they would be the young boys would be accompanied by the pedagogos to keep them safe so this again we're entering into paul's world here it's not our world it's quite different isn't it although of course it's uh you know it doesn't take much thinking to recognize that um children are still prey for adults who want to abuse them in so many parts of our world so we're not contrasting Paul's terrible world with our brilliant world. We're recognising here some of the terrible things that are um, endemic in our fallen world. OK, in Christ Jesus, you are children. Now, the Greek word there is sons. Huioi. Um, the NRSV makes it gender neutral, but it's worth just noting that. OK, as many of you as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. This is where it gets quite interesting. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. Now, the Greek words here, arson kaifelu. The interest, we'll come on to look at those in a moment, but they are super interesting, super interesting. For now, let's note the big obvious difference. Uh, there is no longer um, Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. So the conjunction there is different, isn't it? You are Abraham's offspring. You are Abraham's sperma. OK, and again, the links with English words are obvious, aren't they? OK. So looking even more closely at this passage, what's going on here? Let's think about those words, arson, kai, felu. They are exactly the words that are used in Genesis 1.27 of the first um, humans in the Septuagint, obviously the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Arson, kai, felu, he made them. Okay. 
Where else is it used in the Septuagint? It's used in Genesis 7 to talk about male and female animals on Noah's Ark. It's used in reference to circumcision, and I've given you a couple of um, uh, references there. It's used of baby boys, okay? So we get that at the start of the Exodus story and in Leviticus 12. It's used of the male animals that are offered in sacrifices in the Levitical system, okay? It's used over and over and over again in the early chapters of Leviticus um, to, 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 to say what kind of um, animal needs to be sacrificed in what kind of situation, okay? It's used, um, and again, sticking with Leviticus, um, it's used uh, in the laws that are to do with ritual cleanliness. So again, thinking back to what Ezekiel says, that um, if you want a metaphor for uncleanness, it's a woman's menstrual period. OK, well, how do you deal with that physical uncleanness? You deal with it by ritual cleansing. And so there are laws that, 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 that relate to this, both for women and for men. If men have an emission of semen, there is a ritual cleansing. And after a woman's menstrual period, there will be two. OK, you won't be surprised to hear that there are also laws relating to sexual intercourse in Leviticus. And you can look those up for yourself. They're also there in numbers. It is used. And again, this might be a bit kind of shocking. It might be a bit uncomfortable in Leviticus 27 to enumerate the value of a human life. OK, so sorry, I'm just going to quickly find this one for you, because I think we need to be honest about this and not just uh, kind of uh, make it less shocking than it is. So I'll just read this to you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when a person makes an explicit vow to Yahweh concerning the equivalent for a human being, the equivalent for a male shall be from 20 to 60 years of age. The equivalent shall be 50 shekels of silver by the sanctuary shekel. If the person is a female, the equivalent is 30 shekels. If the age is from five to 20 years of age, the equivalent is 20 shekels for a male and 10 shekels for a female. If the age is from one month to five years, the equivalent for a male is five shekels of silver and for a female, the equivalent is three shekels of silver. And if the person is 60 years or over, then the equivalent for a male is 15 shekels and for a female, 10 shekels. If they cannot afford the equivalent, they shall be brought before the priest and the priest shall assess them and the priest shall assess them according to what each one making the vow can afford. Now, when you read that, that can be shocking to us in our context, too, because when we talk about the value of a human being, the idea of putting a monetary value on any human is shocking to us. It's abhorrent to us, all the more so when we see actually children are worth less than adults. OK, and young children are worth less than teenagers. And at any life stage, women are less than men. This is difficult to avoid in that passage, though. And um, yeah, the words that are used there are arson kaifelu. OK, so the um, the arson is, is the man, felu is is the woman. OK, that is something that we might need to consider how we respond to this. These words are talk, used to talk in, in Joshua about tribal lineage and a couple of times, only a few, though, in the prophetic writings, mostly to do with patrilineage, in other words, to trace the father of each generation so that you can be sure that these people are legitimate heirs. You get that in Jeremiah 20, verse 15. OK. We need to think about Eve, too. So when we think about Adam and Christ, our minds go to Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. When we think about Eve, we would do well to go to 2 Corinthians 11. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me. I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I promised you in marriage to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by its cunning, 
Your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you submit to it readily enough. I think I'm not in the least inferior to these super apostles. I may be untrained in speech, but not in knowledge. Certainly in every way and in all things, we have made this evidence to you. OK, what is Eve doing in Second Corinthians? Let's have a little think about this. I'd be quite good for you just to maybe read that again and to think here about what Eve represents or who Eve represents, how she is described, what actions and responses are attributed to her. Thinking analogically, what is the analogy between Eve and those uh, represented by Eve and why is Paul talking about Eve in this way? I leave that there. But we'll go on to one of the passages which also mentions Eve, which is um, one of the ones which has caused people a very great deal of distress and damage down the ages. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also, that the women, that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works, as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. Now, this is a really complex passage. OK, uh, she will be saved through childbearing. If you think back to the work you've done on doctrine, the idea of salvation through childbearing um, does not feature in any Christian mainstream theology. Therefore, we have to think a bit more deeply in order to make sense of these intriguing and strange words. I think, remember, Second Peter, Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand. So let's have a closer look. I'm just going to pick up a couple of words. First of all, the thing to note is that this is not arson kaifelu. Um, arson kaifelu means male and female. OK, that's very much focusing on the biological, which makes sense of why it's used of animals and why it's used of baby boys being circumcised. OK, because it's to do with the physicality of their bodies. Here, the words that are being used are andras and gynecos. OK, so this is to do with the social roles of men and women. What's in view here is not physicality but sociality. So completely different words. The word silence uh, we will come back to in a moment because it's really important and that also goes for the word authority too. Okay, the word transgressor is interesting. Okay, the word that's used there in Greek is parabasi, which means to overstep, to violate. And it's really interesting to note that this word is used of Adam in Romans chapter 5, verse 14, if I quickly flick to that, Romans 5, verse 14. Yet death exercised dominion over Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, the parabasi of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So this word is used of Adam in Romans 5. It's used here of Eve in 1 Timothy 2. OK, so what does this word Hezekiah, which is translated here as silence, what do we know about it? Well, one of the really helpful ways of starting to understand what a word might mean is to see where else it's used in the New Testament. It's used quite a lot in the New Testament. That's a good thing. 
it's used of men mainly actually this first Timothy passage is one of the very few moments when it's used of women. Now, one of the interesting things, again, translation is a is a very telling process, is that normally it's used, um, it's translated as quiet or quietly. So both of those Thessalonians references are translated in the NRSV as, as quietly. Let's just find um, first Thessalonians 4, uh, 11. Um, now, concerning the love of the brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anyone write to you. We urge you, beloved, to do so more and more, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands. OK, so it's the same word that's used there. And then 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 12. Where are we? Um, here we are. This is talking about busybodies, idlers who are not working. Now, such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. OK, so that's the same word. It's different, isn't it? it sounds very different. And obviously it's much uh, softer when it's used in those contexts. OK, it's used um, also in First Peter. If I quickly flick over to that um, you can look up the others for yourselves. OK, where is it? Um, this is to do with women, actually. And again, we'll see some parallels with what we've just read in First Timothy. Do not adorn yourselves outwardly by braiding your hair and by wearing gold ornaments or fine clothing. Rather, let your adornment be the inner self with the lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's sight. So that word that's translated quiet spirit there is silent in um, First Timothy. It's worth just noting that and asking why sometimes words are translated like this and why on another occasion they might be translated like that. Hmm, we will talk about this in class. Authentio is the verb that Paul is, or, use, or sorry, let me just say that that um, First Timothy is almost certainly not written by Paul. Most biblical scholars would say that this is post-Pauline, uh, pseudepigraphically written in Paul's name, but not actually by himself. OK, and that's not controversial in the first century at all. Everybody understood this as a literary device. Um, yeah. Um, and for nobody in the ancient world, would it be any kind of authority challenge to the words that are written? In fact, pseudepigrapha was a way of proving the authority of words by writing them in the name of the uh, wise and revered teacher. Authentio. Here's the thing, it's not used anywhere else in the New Testament, so you can't do what I've just done with Hezekiah and see where else is it, it's used in the New Testament, because the answer is nowhere. What you can do, and sorry, the word that's used by New Testament scholars for that and other scholars, hapax legomenon. In other words, this is the only time that this word is used in this particular body of writings. You can break it down and find out what its etymology is. Now, that doesn't do all of the work for us. It doesn't tell us everything we need to know about this word, but it does a lot of the um, important work for us. So it comes from autos, oneself, and entea, arms, armour or weapons. OK, Ben Witherington is a, an evangelical um, North American, um, quite conservative biblical scholar. And he says this, the, the verb and its cognates, the other words associated with it, often refers to a strong and indeed abusive use of power or authority. OK, so what's going on here? We're sticking with Ben Witherington. He says this. The situation seems to be that there were high status women, literate women who had previously played important right, roles in some of the pagan cults in Ephesus, even offering instruction and apparently presumed that they could carry on with such roles in their new religion, Christianity. Paul says, in essence, not so fast. You need to listen and learn before you start assuming authority and um, teaching. OK, so, yeah, um, this is a very uh, historically, socially um, 
realistic, sensible way of understanding these words. OK, so the intention is not certainly not to shut women up forever and stop them ever opening their mouths. It's written very much in this particular local social historical context. One thing I don't think I've mentioned on the slides is the words uh, they will be saved through childbearing. The verb there is sozo. That's the word that's used uh, to save. It's obviously used a lot in the New Testament, uh, but it can also be um, uh, translated something like to be salved, to be kept safe. And when you hear those kind of overtones in the words here, they will be saved through childbearing. They will be kept safe as long as they continue in faith and hope. OK, that just is something to bear in mind. I do hope that we will pick up these thoughts and think more on them in class. Um, ben Witherington, by the way, does argue that Paul wrote First Timothy. Most scholars would say this letter is post Pauline pseudepigraphy. OK, we're going to head over to First Corinthians 11, where we find again um, a very complex chapter which has a practical application in the local church. It's to do with what women should wear on their heads. But the rationale for this uh, to the answer to this question is anything but straightforward. OK, I won't read it all to you here. Um, because it's quite long and you can do that for yourself. But let's pick up on some of the words. The Greek words for man and woman here, again, they're much more similar to 1 Timothy than they are to Galatians 3. The words that are used are andros and gyne. Okay? They can also be translated husband and wife because there are no specific words that are translated husband and wife differentiated from, differentiated from man and woman, by the way. Um, the word head here is kephale, um, and it's an interesting word. It's a really common uh, metaphor. It can be used for the, the, the head of a river, for example. OK, so the source, uh, but it can also be used as a biological word. So it's used in the corpus hippocratum for somebody's physical head. And so this leads to a quite a fierce debate. How exactly is this word being used in this particular context? Does it mean source, as in river, or does it mean ruler? OK, there's another word for, for ruler, um, arche, but then again, that also means beginning. And arche is used at the beginning, for example, of John's Gospel in the Johannine Prologue. In the beginning was the word, the word there is arche, and that is very much to do with uh, the, the, the beginning of all things, the beginning of all time. So I think it's impossible to say, well, clearly Arche means, um, you know, the ruler, as in archbishop, and Kephale means the source. Um, no, they, they, they seem to be used much more interchangeably. There's a lot of overlap between those two words, Arche and Kephale, and the way in which both of them use, are used really depends very much on the context. So it's not easy to figure this one out. OK, the meaning is best inferred from the context because what? Yeah, because of what I just said. And this context refers to the Genesis narrative. If you read first um, Corinthians 11, you will see uh, that reference to um, to Adam and Eve. OK. Um, you'll see that in sorry i'm just looking at here uh yeah verses 11 to 13. okay so where have we got to um first corinthians 11 verse 8 indeed man was not made from woman but woman from man now this is a reference to the genesis story too eve was taken from the rib of Adam. OK, so this is about going back to the source. Therefore, one could argue it's most likely that Paul is using Kephale to say that Adam, not Eve, is the source of humankind. Adam is the first human. We think um, also of these complicated words of um, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 7, for a man ought not to have his head veiled, 
since he is the image and reflection of God, but woman is the reflection of man. Now, there are Aristotelian echoes coming through here, aren't there? OK, man is the image of God, but woman is the image. Sorry, but woman is um, and actually the Greek word that's used here, verse seven, is not reflection, it's glory, it's doxa. And if you look down at the footnotes that you've got in your NOSV, you should see that. So women are the glory of men. Men are the glory of God. Now, that might sound as horrifically shocking as Aristotle saying that a woman is a defective man until you think about Aristotle's cosmology. And remember those concentric circles, each one moving in harmony with the others because it is in their nature to do so. Paul could say, well, of course, men are the image and glory of God because God is on the next kind of layer out in all of these concentric circles. And women are the glory of men because they are the next circle into men. So if you can imagine the concentric circles with uh, women and then men and then God. OK, this is how it works because of this. Uh, the woman ought to have authority on the head because of the angels. Now, this is one of the most um, complex verses, I think, in any of Paul's writings. One thing to say is that the translators of the NRSV try and help by adding um, a couple of words. So they add the words a symbol of. They say for this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. But those words are symbol of a knot in the Greek. And again, if you look in your notes in the NRSV, the footnotes uh, should make that clear. The actual sentence is for this reason, a woman ought to have authority on her head because of the angels. Now, what's going on there? Again, you might want to say, well, actually, angels in this kind of cosmology, they're, they're, they're out in another circle, aren't they somewhere? What's going on with them? Well, um, there's been some really interesting work that's been done by another American um, New Testament scholar, Dale Martin, who draws attention to the illegitimate sexual relationships between fallen angels and humans. We see that in uh, the letter to Jude as well. If you give that a look, you will see there. Um, uh, references to angels who who uh, fall and then want to um, have sex with um, human women. OK, so why must women cover their heads when they're in worship? They are vulnerable and their vulnerability must be covered so that the angels aren't uh, uh, drawn to their beauty and therefore they are seduced or raped. Now, that is one answer to that question. It's an interesting one. Um, I'm not sure that any other particular answer has been advanced. Let's think, though, about this whole idea for the moment about um, the kind of uh, the, the sweep of, of the argument in 1 Corinthians 11. It starts off by talking about this hierarchical world, describing that. Let me just go back to First Corinthians. OK. Um, so here we have should um, women uh, cover their heads? Chapter 11, verse two. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. That's carefully. And that the man is the head of his woman and God is the head of Christ. So you can see how those concentric circles working there. God, Christ, man, woman. Anyone who prays or prophesies with his head disgraces on his, his disgraces his head. And so it goes on. OK, and then it goes on to say men should not have their head veiled, but women should. OK. And that all makes perfect logical sense to a first century Greco-Roman Jewish person like Paul. OK, then we get to verse 11, 
when something dramatic happens. The word that starts verse 11 is nevertheless. OK, that word in Greek is, is it's pronounced plain, OK, plain. And it can be translated as something like nevertheless, only, yet. However, having said all of that, in any case, be that as it may, it's a very strong contrast to what has come before. So it's like when you're writing an essay and you write one paragraph in favour of an argument and you say, having said all of that, let's look at it from a different angle and we'll see something completely different before you then reach your conclusion. This is what Paul's doing here. It doesn't negate what, or contradict what he's just said, but it does put the preceding statement into perspective by saying something much more important. OK, sometimes it refers to the one factor that changes everything. And there are some more references there that you might want to go and look out, look, look up. Sorry. What comes after it then? Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man or man independent of woman. Nevertheless, in the Lord. Now, that in Greek is en Christo. For Paul, being in Christ is shorthand for talking about salvation, those who will be saved, the baptised, those who are part of the family of God. When we are in Christ, everything changes. And we see this very powerfully in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. So if anyone is in Christ and Christo, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. This isn't simply and solely about individual salvation. That word everything is as all inclusive in Greek as it is in English. Panta, the whole of everything. And then we think back to this idea of recapitulation, God working to reverse the forces which were moving towards uh, destruction and to work so as to reverse that process to bring it back to new life. So here what we see is, of course, with Adam and Eve in the Old uh, Testament in Genesis, we see the, the curse. OK, and in Christ, we see the reversal of that, that curse of the fall that puts enmity between male and female, as we see in Genesis 3, verse 15. And um, there's a beautiful uh, moment in Galatians which says something really similar to this, but not with reference to gender. OK, this is Genesis. Sorry, Galatians. Uh, uh, 3 starting verse 10 for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse think Genesis 3 for it is written cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law now it is evident that no one is justified before God before the law for the one who is righteous will live by faith that's Habakkuk 2 verse 4 being quoted there but the law does not rest on faith on the contrary Whoever does the works of the law will live by them. Here's the key. Uh, Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. So by becoming the cross, the, the curse, Jesus becomes a curse for us and therefore he um, absorbs into his body on the cross the full curse that was laid on Adam and Eve and therefore in Jesus on the cross the old Adam dies because the old Adam is cursed and Jesus takes that curse into himself which is then, which means that the resurrected Jesus is free, freed of the curse and um, all humanity with him. This is uh, the reversal of the fortunes of humankind in the person of Jesus Christ. So in Christo, everything changes. So going back then to 1 Corinthians 11, let's go back. As we've seen, Verses uh, 2 to um, 10 
narrate this kind of very uh, logical um, worldview in which uh, women are ruled by men, men are ruled by Christ, Christ is ruled by God. Concentric circles, each moving in perfect harmony. OK, nevertheless, verse 11, in the Lord, everything looks different. In the Lord, woman is not independent of man or man independent of woman. For just as woman came from man, so man comes through woman, but all come from God. So if you're going to want to have an argument about who came first or who's more important, men or women, then ultimately you're on to a losing uh, battle because ultimately all come from God. OK. Um, OK, Adam might have been the first human to come into the world. But then since Adam, all men have been born of women and therefore all are interdependent. So Paul ends up arguing strongly for the interdependence of all people, not the superiority of men over women. Or indeed the other way around. One thing, I've just checked this out in the Greek, yeah. Um, the Greek doesn't have the word things in it in verse, uh, at the end of verse 12. The Greek just says all come from God. And I think in the context of this passage, it makes a lot more sense to read that all as referring to people, not things. I don't know why they put things in there. Interesting to speculate that, isn't it? So there we are. Um, why is this important and why, why, why is this even an issue, you might be thinking. In the first century, there was a belief that the first human was both male and female. OK, we see this in Philo's writings when uh, we, we talked about Philo as a Greek Jewish uh, philosopher from Alexandria who writes in this very analogical way and writes commentaries on all of the books of the Septuagint. When he writes questions and answers on Genesis 1.25, he writes this. One half of the body of the man, Adam, is woman. OK, now this being is referred to in scholarly literature as the primal or the primordial androgyne. OK, so thinking about those Greek words, andros for a man, gyne for a woman. The idea here is that male and female are un undifferentiated. It's just one human being. It only becomes differentiated when the woman is created. Until the moment the woman is created, there is no concept of, of biological sex at all. OK, so how do we take this idea of the primal androgyne, which again, um, when we hear it for the first time, might sound really odd, but it wasn't odd in the first century. It was something which Philo writes about quite straightforwardly. Erdsight, like Ensight, remembering Bernard uh, Brevard Child's work on the fulfilment of the times. Time will come full circle. The end times will resemble the earliest times. So that now, now then, that Jesus has been resurrected, now that he's inaugurated the end times, now that he is the first fruit of the new creation, is gender no longer relevant? Is there no, um, is, is there no place at all in the church for gendered considerations? Paul clearly refutes this idea. He says, actually, no, Ma the, the, the male was created first and then the female. The male is the source of the female. OK, so he's arguing against this idea that gender is irrelevant. It is relevant, but ultimately all are interdependent. And that's the important thing. What about women teaching in church? This keeps us in First Corinthians for a moment. First Corinthians 11.5 describes women speaking in church. The word that's used is prophesying. OK, so that's First Corinthians 11, it's the same passage we've just been looking at. Any woman who prays or prophesies with her head unveiled disgraces her head. Now, that only makes sense in a context in which women stand up to speak. The tricky passage comes a couple of chapters later, as if we haven't looked at enough tricky passages already. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33 to 36. The end of 33. 
As in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Hmm. OK, now the word silence, it's worth noting, is used a couple of times in this um, passage in 1 Corinthians 14. It's used in verse 28. If there is no one to interpret the gift of tongues, let them be silent in church. Verse 30, if a revelation is made to somebody else sitting nearby, let the first per person be silent. So being silent is something which is um, recommended for quite a few people in, 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 in church. Now, quite a few scholars think that this mention of women not being allowed to speak in church um, is a later interpolation. Um, Gordon Fee is a quite conservative Pentecostal uh, New Testament scholar, and he argues that this is a later addition. It's difficult to, to kind of square it with what Paul has just been describing a couple of chapters earlier in the uh, chapter 11. Let me quickly just mention one um, word, if I may, which is in verse 34. Okay, the word speak there, women are not allowed to speak. The verb there is, um, well, the Greek verb is laleo, and it's just a really straightforward word meaning speak. OK, it's a word that Paul doesn't actually use of himself anywhere. He talks about himself pro proclaiming, expounding. Um, uh, you know, he, he talks about preaching, prophesying. Um, yes, proclaiming. Those are the words that Paul uses to describe what he's doing. This is not that word. It's a different word. And it's much more straightforward, much more down to earth word. It just simply means speak. Yeah. So it's interesting to note that whatever Paul is saying, assuming these are Paul's words, that women should not do in church, it's not a word that he ever uses to describe what he's doing in church. That's interesting, isn't it? Is it a later interpolation? Is it describing a situation in which women um, are becoming restless and a bit noisy, a bit disruptive, bearing in mind that churches um, met in people's homes often people were crammed into rooms if people couldn't quite hear if people couldn't understand they might be asking what's he saying what's going on here um you know have you heard the latest gossip it might be that kind of scenario too that word laleo would describe um that kind of chit chat really much more than it could ever describe anything official that would be said in the course of leading a service. It's not to do with preaching at all. OK. So what does Paul make of all of this? I don't think he's that interested. OK, I think if I uh, were to meet Paul today and tell him that I've been just spending the last hour and a half talking about what he thinks about gender, he would say, why are you wasting your time? Don't you realise how close the end is, don't you realise how precious the gospel is? Don't you realise the, um, the, 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 the love that God has for all people? Why are you wasting your time talking about gender, for goodness sake? That is the least important thing. And you get that sense, actually, I think, in First Corinthians, when he's forced out of necessity to um, give rulings, to give a kind of uh, an answer to various pastoral uh, disasters that have emerged in the Corinthian church. But um, he kind of says at one point, I wish that you all were as I am. In other words, celibate, unmarried. But uh, that's 1 Corinthians 7 verse 7, by the way, where he says that. Um, but he recognises that most people are married. Most people are living in sexual relationships and therefore you have to you have to give an, uh, a, a good steer for that. And he uses the metaphor of the church as the body of Christ to be the guiding principle of what we do with our physical bodies in sexual intimacy. OK, but ultimately his eye is on the telos. His eye is on the eschaton. His eye is on the second coming of Christ. E.P. Sanders puts it really well. Paul's theology contained the potential for social revolution because he sees that in the Lord all things are being new. The curse between Adam and Eve 
has been uh, absorbed into the body of Jesus on the cross and that uh, curse has now been reversed to be a blessing for the whole world. So the, this teaching contains the potential for social revelation and yet Paul is not a, a, a social, he doesn't have a social program and he's certainly not a gender theorist and time is short. Time is short, as he says, there is not time to remake society. This is why, as I say, none of this would have been controversial in Paul's day. It is for us, but it wouldn't have been for him. OK, last point, same sex relationships. Like I say, this is something um, which uh, Paul's world was so incredibly different to our own that we have to try our best to, to understand what he's talking about. Romans 1 is the um, appropriate passage for us to think about here. And again, these are words that have been used to do enormous harm to um, LGBT people. Um, it's part of a meta-narrative of salvation. OK, if you look at the shape of Romans, you see this kind of um, shape whereby you start with um, God's um, uh, Actually, it starts pretty thunderously. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And then you see a story whereby people kind of basically dip down morality um, and ethically. OK, God gave them up. He handed them over. Same word that's used of Judas uh, betraying Jesus in the gospel. OK, um, same word that's used of uh, God giving Pharaoh over to a hard heart in the Exodus story as well. But this is a kind of, you know, a story that goes down and then it looks just when it's looking really hopeless at the absolute bottom, the U curve comes back up again. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it ends up by saying, OK, what's God doing now with those in Israel who have not uh, accepted Jesus? OK, so these words about sex are part of that meta narrative and this is on the the kind of downward slope part of it okay so romans uh, 1 verses 26 to 32 um the words that are um important here well the one word really is natural what does paul mean by natural okay um, the word that's used, sorry, let me just find the Greek word. Um, I've got the New Test, the NRSV, and I've got the Greek, um, yeah, physike. So he's talking about the kind of, um, his idea of what is natural is the same kind of intrinsic qualities in each being that cause them to act and to move in the way that they do. So think about that Aristotelian cosmology with all of the planets turning because it's in their nature to turn. OK, so how does Paul see the natural um, movements of the human? Now, one thing to bear in mind, like I say, is that Paul's thought world is completely different to ours on this. For Paul, it would be totally understandable that men would be attracted sexually both to other men and to women, particularly men would be attracted to younger men. OK, that for Paul, that's that's natural. That's normal. Why wouldn't you be? OK, um, the two categories in the ancient world are not gay and straight. That just does not exist. The two categories are active and passive, and this is really, really, really important. So sexual relations between two people of the same sex are not necessarily condemned. That's what E.P. Sanders says. Free adult men should penetrate, here's the thing, but not be penetrated. It was considered natural, there's that word again, for a male to, to, to desire both female and male partners. This is why it's so important to have an understanding of the Aristotelian worldview, OK, because to to be penetrated, uh, sorry, to penetrate someone else. Sorry, this is all a bit biological, isn't it? Is to dominate them. To be penetrated is to submit. So if you think about all of those concentric circles, the one doing the penetrating, the active person is uh, at a higher level. The person who's being penetrated is submitting they are inherently uh, inferior 
that's Aristotelian cosmology working its way into Aristotelian morality. Okay, it's deemed beneath the dignity of an active adult man to be penetrated because that would make him passive. Okay, it was deemed the right of an adult man to penetrate someone lesser than himself, normally someone younger than himself. And whether that younger person was a male or female was much less important because women were always in the ancient world deemed inferior to men in that qualitative sense. Women were defective males, okay, as Aristotle says. The idea of sexual orientation simply did not exist in the first century. And the idea of a sexual relationship between two adult men uh, simply didn't make any sense because one of them would have to become passive one of them would have to be active and therefore they would be inherently unbalanced. The idea of two adults being in an equal relationship uh, of the same biological sex was just, it did not compute, it did not make sense. Okay, and the idea of two women uh, being in a sexual relationship was in no one's mind. Well, there are some writings, obviously, Sappho's in uh, the, 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 um, uh, sorry, Sappho, the, the, the writings from, from Lesbos do kind of have some of this, but that's um, really unusual, actually. What is natural sex? OK, this is a big question here. Um, it's the sex that leads to conception, to the making of a baby. So that makes sense of verse um, 26 in Romans 1. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. Their women exchange natural intercourse for unnatural. OK, so I'll leave that to you to work out what kind of sex Paul is condemning here. Uh, but natural sex would have been that which would then enable a new baby to come into the world. Now, one really interesting book that's been written on this area is Paul Among the People. That's a tiny little thumbnail sketch for there by Sarah Rudin. Um, written in 2015. Sarah Rudin is a, no sorry, 2010. Um, Sarah Rudin is a classicist, okay, and she has written this book to try and understand Paul against a classical worldview. So she doesn't really have the Jewish worldview in mind here or the early Christian one, but she does have the Greco-Roman worldview very much in mind. And um, in her treatment of this question on Paul and homosexuality, her argument is that in the Greco-Roman world, there was only domination and brutalism uh, when it came to sexual behaviour between men. There was no place for safe sex between men. OK, in the ancient world, you do get some idealised passages in Plato, but Sarah Rudin argues that these are absolute outliers. Uh, what's most um, likely is that um, gay sex, if we want to use those terms that are contemporary to our society, are nothing other than rape and brutality. A raped male uh, adult can, um, let me just read a little bit. Of, of, of this and then you can see the kind of the shocking backgrounds which we um, which we need to try and understand in order to make sense of Romans 1 really okay um, here we are let me just read this is from Paul Among the People by Sarah Rudin a pious Jewish family as Paul's probably was would not have condoned sexual abuse of any of its slaves but he would know from his non-Jewish friends that household slaves normally were less respected as outlets for bodily functions than were household toilets. And that a sanctioned role of a slave boy was anal sex with free adults. Flagrant paedophiles may have pestered him and his friends on the way to and from school, offered friendship, offered tutoring, offered athletic training, offered money or gifts. But adults he trusted would have told him that even um, any flirting could ruin his reputation and at worst get him officially classed as a male prostitute with the loss of all 
his civic rights. After his conversion, as he preached what Jesus meant for human society, he wasn't going to let anyone believe that it included any of this. And this book kind of goes on to talk about um, the penetration of one man by another as a way of humiliating, emasculating and ruining that man's uh, virility. Of course, the word vir virility is linked to the Latin word for masculinity. OK, so why does Paul condemn same sex sexual acts? Well, the world in which Paul lived was one in which such acts were only brutal, only humiliating, could potentially wreck people's lives. OK, depending on how privileged they were, depending on how old they were, because that if they were in adulthood, they were protected. If they were younger, they were vulnerable. So is Paul describing something here which we, too, would condemn with the strongest possible language? Pedastry, as it's called in the ancient world, paedophilia, as it is in ours. OK, that was a lot. Um, I'm just going to go back to where I started Second Peter. Um, let me quickly flick to that. Uh, where's Second Peter? OK, so also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. There are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Yeah, let's think about that when we come together in class. There are complex things here to do with men and women's bodies. Arsen Kaifelu. Galatians 3 is Paul simply saying that now that circumcision is not the rite of initiation, but rather baptism, the physical, biological sex makes no difference as to who's in and who cannot be in. Jewish Judaism has never had female genital circumcision. OK, is that what's going on there? First Corinthians, Paul writes about headship as that natural turning of the planets, that natural movement of peoples. And then he says, however, in the Lord, all are interdependent of each other. 1 Corinthians 14, women are not to speak in church. Speaking just simply means speaking, not preaching, not proclaiming, not prophesying. OK, what do we make of that? And then what about Eve in 2 Corinthians 11? Eve, the transgressor, the same language is used of her that is used of Adam in Romans 5. You can see how complex all of this is, but in what we will do in class is we will pick up some of these threads and we will think about how we have heard these passages, how we have received them and what we might do with them as we take this inheritance and pass it on in our preaching and in our um, exegesis. There's been a lot there. Um, I think it's time for me to go and have a nice lie down in a darkened room. And uh, I'm sure that uh, if um, either the writer of Second Peter or indeed Paul himself would be would be to give me some advice now, I'd be to stop thinking about gender and thinking about something else because it's not the most important part of Paul's charisma, Paul's Paul's message, but it is the one which a lot of us get um, hurt by. And so it's important for us to think about it. I hope this has been helpful just to get our heads in the game, but you can see why it was important for me to lay this all out before class uh, when we meet together. OK, take care then.